Welcome to the Inspirational Living Podcast. I'd like to start today by wishing you all a healthy, happy, and prosperous new year. I'd also like to thank everyone who has purchased the Majesty Program, which we launched last week. It's an affirmations program that I personally use, and one that has had a transformational impact on my life. I fully trust that it will have the same positive impact on your personal and professional life too. I want to emphasize that the Majesty Program is just that. It's a systematic program and not simply the auto-suggestion sound meditation that we use. If you have purchased the meditation audio, it's important that you follow all of the steps and instructions outlined on our website, including watching the preparation videos and using the meditation twice daily for the first 30 days. For those who haven't purchased the program yet, the cost is only $11.99, and because you are a listener of our podcast, you can get 30% off that price by using the special coupon code INSPIRATION. To learn more, please visit livinghour.org forward slash majesty. Now let's move on to today's reading, which was edited and adapted from the book Your Forces and How to Use Them by Christian D. Larson, published in 1909. Life is growth, and the object of right thinking is to promote that growth. Give less time trying to change the opinions of others, and more time trying to improve your own life. Life becomes the way it is lived, and we may live the way we want to live when we learn to think what we want to think. Create your own thought, and you become what you want to become because your thought creates you. We all know that we are as we think. Then we must think only such thoughts as tend to make us what we wish to be. The secret of right thinking is found in always keeping the mind's eye fixed upon the greater and the better in all things. Scientific research in the metaphysical field has demonstrated the fact we are what we think that we become what we think, and that what we think in the present determines what we are to become in the future, and also that since we can change our thoughts for the better along any line, we can therefore completely change ourselves along any line. But the majority of us who try to apply this law do not succeed to a great degree, the reason being that instead of working entirely upon the principle that we are as we think, we proceed in the belief that we are what we think we are. At first sight, there may seem to be no difference between the principle that we are as we think and the belief that we are what we think we are, but close study will reveal the fact that the latter is absolutely untrue. You are not what you think you are, because personality, mentality, and character are not determined by personal opinions. It is the thought of the heart, that is, the mental expression from the subconscious, that makes the personal you what you are. But the subconscious is affected only by what you actually think in the real field of creative thought, and not by what you may think of yourself in the field of mere personal opinion. It is subjective thought that makes you what you are, but to think that you are thus or so will not necessarily make you thus or so. To create subjective thought, you must act directly upon the subconscious, but it is not possible to impress the subconscious while you are forming opinions about your personal self. A mere statement about yourself will not affect or change the subconscious, and so long as the subconscious remains unchanged, you will remain unchanged too. While you are thinking simply about your external or personal self, you are acting upon the objective, but to change yourself, you must act upon the subjective. 
You may think that you are great, but so long as you continue to think small thoughts, you will continue to be small. No matter how high an opinion we may have of ourselves, while we are living in the superficial, our thoughts will be empty, and empty thoughts are not conductive to high attainments and great achievements. We become great when we think great thoughts, and to think great thoughts, we must transcend the limitations and circumscribed conditions of the individual and mentally enter into the world of the great and the superior. We must seek to gain a larger and a larger consciousness of the world of real quality, real worth, and real superiority, and must dwell upon the loftiest mountain peaks of mind that we can possibly reach. We must live in the life of greatness, breathe the spirit of greatness, and feel the very soul of greatness. Then, and only then, will we think great thoughts, and the mind that continues to think great thoughts will continue to grow in greatness. What you give to your thought, your thought will give to you, and you will be and become accordingly, no matter what you may think that you are. The cause that you originate in the within will produce its effect in the without, regardless of what your opinions may be. Your personal life will consequently be the result of what you think, but it will not necessarily be what you think it is. For example, you may think that you are healthy and well, but you will not secure health truly until you think thoughts that produce health. You may persistently affirm that you are well, but so long as you live in discord, confusion, worry, fear, and other wrong states of mind, you will be sick. That is, you will be as you think, and not what you think you are. You may state health in your thought, but if you give worry, fear, and discord to that thought, your thinking will produce discord. It is not what we state in our thoughts, but what we give to our thoughts that determine results. To produce health, thought itself must be healthful and positive. It must contain the quality of health and the very life of health. This, however, is not possible unless the mind is conscious of health at the time when such thought is being produced. Therefore, to think thoughts that can produce health, the mind must enter into the realization of the being of health, and not simply dwell in the objective belief about health. Now, let's talk about intelligence and ability. You may think that your mind is brilliant, and you may undertake the most difficult tasks in the belief that you are equal to the occasion. But the question is if your conception of brilliancy is great or small. If your conception of brilliancy is small, you may be right to that degree in thinking you are brilliant. That is, you may be brilliant as far as your understanding of brilliancy goes. Whether that is sufficient or not to carry out the task that is before you is another question. Your opinion of your mental capacity may be great, but if your idea of intelligence is crude, your intelligence-producing thought will also be crude. And can produce only crude intelligence. It is therefore evident that to simply think that you are brilliant will not produce brilliancy unless your understanding of brilliancy is made larger, higher, and finer. Do not call yourself brilliant at any time, or do not think of yourself as lacking in brilliancy. Simply fix the mental eye upon absolute brilliancy and desire with all the power of mind and soul to go on and on into higher steps of that brilliancy. When all the elements and forces of your system are working in such a way that beauty will naturally be produced, you will be beautiful, whether you think you are beautiful or not. And it is the actions of the subconscious 
that determine how the elements and forces of the system are to work. Therefore, the beautiful person is beautiful because their real interior thinking is conducive to the creation of the beautiful. That person, however, who is not beautiful, does not necessarily think ugly thoughts, but their interior mental actions have not been brought together in such a way as to produce the expression of beauty. That is, the subconscious actions have not been arranged according to the most perfect pattern. But these actions can be arranged in that manner, not by thinking that one is beautiful, but by thinking thoughts that are beautiful. When you think that you are beautiful, you are liable to think that you are more beautiful than others, and such a thought is not a beautiful thought. To recognize or criticize ugliness and inferiority in others is to create the inferior and the ugly in yourself, and what you create in yourself will sooner or later be expressed through your mind and personality. So long as you worry, hate, or fear, your thought will make you disagreeable in mind and character, and later on in the person as well. And no amount of affirming or thinking that you are beautiful will overcome those ugly states of mind that you have created. You will thus be as you think, worried, hateful, and ugly, and not beautiful as you may try to think you are. The personal individual is the result not of beliefs or opinions, but of the quality of all the mental actions that are at work throughout the whole mind. You are as you think in every thought, and not what you think you are in one or more isolated parts of your personal self. You may think that you are good, but your idea of goodness may be wrong. Your thought, therefore, will not be conducive to goodness. On the contrary, the more you praise yourself for being good, the less goodness you will express in your nature. In addition, to think of yourself as good will have a tendency to produce a feeling of self-righteousness. This feeling will cause the mind to look down upon the less fortunate, and a mind that looks down will soon begin to go down, and you will be no better than those whom you criticized before. You are only as good as the sum total of all your good thoughts, and these can be increased in number indefinitely by training the mind to perpetually grow in the consciousness of absolute goodness. To grow in the consciousness of goodness, keep the mental eye upon the highest conception of absolute goodness. Try to enlarge, elevate, and define this conception or understanding of goodness perpetually. Pattern your whole life, all your thoughts, and all your actions after the likeness of this highest understanding. Then never look back, nor try to measure the goodness that you may think you now possess. Press on eternally to the higher and larger realization of absolute goodness and leave results to the law. More and more real goodness will naturally appear in all your thoughts and actions. You will therefore become good, not by thinking that you are good, but by thinking thoughts that are created in the image and likeness of that which is good. To think thoughts that can give you more life, you must enter into the consciousness of absolute life, but you cannot enter the absolute life while you are defining or measuring the personal. If you wish to possess more quality, you must give your thoughts more quality and worth. You must forget the lesser worth of the personal and enter into the consciousness of the greater worth of absolute worth itself. So long as you think that you are thus or so in the personal sense, your thought will be on the surface. You will mentally live among effects. You will not create new causes, therefore will not produce any changes in yourself. You will continue to be as you are thinking deep down in the subconscious, where hereditary tendencies, habits, race thoughts, and other mental forces continue their usual work, 
regardless of your personal opinion or empty thoughts on the surface. To change yourself, you must go to that depth of mind where the causes of your personal condition exist. But your mind will not enter the depth of the within so long as your thought is on the surface and your thought will be on the surface so long as you are thinking exclusively about your personal self. The secret, therefore, is not to form opinions about yourself or to think about yourself as being thus or so, but to form larger conceptions of principles and qualities. Enter the richness of real life and you will think richer thoughts. Forget the limitations, the weaknesses, and the shortcomings of your personal self, as well as your superficial opinions of your personal self, and enter mentally into the greatness, the grandeur, the sublimity, and the splendor of all things. Seek to gain a larger and a larger understanding of the majesty and the marvelousness of all life, and aspire to think the thoughts of the infinite. This is the secret of thinking great thoughts, and those will positively become great whose thoughts are always great. The Inspirational Living Podcast is a production of The Living Hour. To purchase the Majesty program, which employs our powerful auto-suggestion sound method, please go to livinghour.org forward slash majesty. Use the coupon code INSPIRATION to receive 30% off the sales price. Subscribe to our free podcast at the iTunes Store, Stitcher.com, or Google Play. Thanks for listening. I look forward to talking with you next time. Welcome to the Inspirational Living Podcast, brought to you in part by Book of Zen, inspirational fashion for a better world. Learn more at bookofzen.com. Today's reading was edited and adapted from The Psychology of Success by Newton N. Riddle, published in 1909. There are elements of genius in every man and woman that, if awakened and trained, will enable them to do something worthwhile. There are stores of energy and ambition in every brain that, if unlocked and given expression in action, will supply the force necessary to bring things to pass. There are germs of goodness and divinity in every soul that if quickened by love and wrought into character, will enable them to live a clean and self-respecting moral life. Awaken the genius, unlock the energies, quicken the divinity in a person, change them from negative to positive, combine their intellect, energy, and conscience in harmonious expression, and you have given to that person the positive psychology of success. What is success? What constitutes success? If we are to see things alike, we must have the same viewpoint. Briefly, success is the accomplishment of anything attempted. But we must get a larger view of the subject. We must measure success first from the viewpoint of the individual and second, from their relation to society. We must measure success in the individual not wholly by their objective achievements in the few years that belong to the earth life, but in the light of the fact that the influence of their life extends far into the future. We must measure the success of the individual as related to humanity not merely by their personal influence upon their family, their neighbors, and their age, 
but in the light of heredity, social evolution, and humanity's relation to God and eternity. We have lacked perspective in our current view of success. Much that we have called success has really been failure. To do much work and accomplish little is not success. To pile up a fortune out of other people's earnings without producing any real wealth is not success. To acquire wealth or fame or to accomplish some great undertaking at the expense of health, conscience, or character is not success. To win out in business or profession yet neglect wife and children, soul growth, or civic duties is not success. How then shall we measure success? By the honest work done, by the money earned or wealth produced, by the knowledge acquired, culture attained, and character realized, by the joy experienced and the happiness given to others, by the influence exerted and the service rendered in harmony with the law of human progress. If success includes material prosperity, soul growth, and service to others, there must be some way devised to attain all of these at the same time. There is a very generally accepted idea that if one gives themselves fully to their vocation and succeeds in material things, they must neglect the spiritual. This idea is fundamentally wrong. The activities necessary for material prosperity, if prompted by unselfish motives, instead of being restrictive to moral and spiritual growth, are conducive to such growth. The fact that most persons who give themselves wholly to their work become so engrossed in it that they fail in moral and spiritual attainment is no proof whatsoever that such a result is necessary. It is all a question of motive. The effects of any act are determined largely by the motive that prompts it and the mental and emotional states that occur during the activity. If we act from selfish motives, every such activity no matter how noble its purpose or worthy its end, will inhibit soul growth and tend to narrow and contract the life. Whereas if we act from selfless love, no matter how simple or menial the act, it is conducive to moral and spiritual attainment. One may preach the gospel or engage in the most noble of callings, actuated by selfish motives and in these worthy activities become narrow, irritable, and spiritually inert. Or one may sweep streets and clean alleys for a livelihood, actuated by pure love, the thought of service, and the glory of the divine, and out of these menial activities develop a beautiful soul and ripen an exalted character. The main object of my talk today involves method, it is easy to tell folks what to do and what not to do, but how to do it is another thing. All the essential elements for success might be mentioned in a single breath, but what good would it do without the knowledge of how to acquire these elements? Let's begin by acknowledging that God works through personalities. Behind every great reformation, social, political, and religious, has been a personality. The history of the world's progress is a history of great personalities, and in every happy home there is a personality, a loving wife, a kind husband. Look about you and wherever you find true success, in public or private life, in the church, the schoolroom, the business, the office, the factory, the shop, or the home you will find that the secret of success is in a personality. The problem before us then is how to build a strong, harmonious, winning, exalted personality. Before we begin the building of a personality, we must clear away certain false notions relative to the causes of success and failure, 
and lay a few foundation stones. First, get out of your head the notion that success depends upon opportunity or environment. True, these are necessary for the expression of energy or talent, but the primary causes of success or failure are in the individual. Law reigns throughout all of our relations and activities. There is no realm of caprice. Cause and effect are inseparably related. Things do not happen without an adequate cause. The laws of affinity of natural selection are as active and unerring in the realms of mind, society, and business as in the mineral kingdom and natural world. Get rid of the idea that the world owes you a living. True, you are not responsible for being here, but neither is the rest of humanity responsible either, except your immediate parents. Therefore, the world owes you nothing. We live in a bountiful country, one that has given you birth, protection, food, clothing, a home, friends, education, and opportunity for development, happiness, service, and success. You are the debtor. It will take all the rest of your natural life to square yourself and meet your just obligations. Get ready. Go to work. Be all you can and do all you can in the development of self and in promoting the progress of humanity. Learn to take advantage of your neighbors and get the best of them. Now don't be shocked by this statement. Let me explain. In every respectable person you know there are desirable traits of character. In every loving friend there are qualities that you need. Take advantage of your associations with these good people. Select the best there is in their natures and embody their virtues in yourself. Never mind their faults. You have enough of your own. You will find what you are looking for. You will embody what you recognize and admire. Therefore look for the elements of success and admire and cherish the virtues of your friends. Let's say a man moves next door to me and says, I am going to watch you. I am going to find all your weak points and detect your meanness. My reply is, All right, neighbor. I am going to watch you. I hope to discover your strong points, the secret of your success, and your elements of goodness. Each of us finds what we look for with the result that he embodies the worst of me and weakens himself, but I embody the best of him and add to my character. Put away the desire to get something for nothing. It is fundamentally wrong. It belongs to the psychology of crime. It is excusable in idiots and children, but to the normal mature mind it is illogical. In a world where cause and effect balance each other, something for nothing is impossible. Every gift, whether of wealth, intelligence, love, confidence, favor, or opportunity, carries with it an equivalent obligation. Even the gift of salvation implies a life of service in return. If you would succeed, start out in life with the idea of earning your own way paying for what you get, and giving value received. All things whatsoever a person has are theirs in trust only, and those who fail to give back to the world the equivalent of what has been entrusted to them are not a success. Don't depend upon luck, accidental opportunities, or games of chance. Drifting ships often make long journeys, but seldom reach the desired harbor. Would you succeed, have a purpose. Decide early in life what you are going to do. Then work with a method. Don't try to do everything or know everything. This is the age of the specialist. Mr. Jack of all trades is out of a job. Dr. Know-it-all is a charlatan. The person who can do one thing well is in great demand. 
The professional who knows everything about their specialty is equipped for life work. Concentrate your energies and talents upon something worthwhile. Master it, stay with it, and you will win out. Don't be afraid of hard work. Activity gives life, inertia death. Well-directed effort develops power, capacity, courage, self-reliance, virtue, mind, and character. Idleness or a life of ease begets weakness, carelessness, indifference, stupidity, vice, and worthlessness. Constitutional laziness is a worse handicap in the race of life than chronic heartburn or diabetes. Study the personal habits of the men and women who have made history. Get close to those who are winning fame or fortune in art, literature, science, business, or profession, and you will find that every winner is a worker. Genius consists largely in the disposition and capacity for persistent hard work. As Thomas Edison once said, genius is 2% inspiration and 98% perspiration. Dismiss the notion that selfishness is essential to success. Selfishness is suicidal. A person who lives for self suffers much, dwarfs their soul, accomplishes little, and dies a failure. The person who lives to serve has found the secret of success, true happiness, soul growth, and eternal life. If you would be happy, if you would win out in the battles of life, renounce your selfish desires, enter a worthy vocation, and render the largest service possible to your age and generation. Take no thought of self except to improve. Do all the good you can, to everyone you can, in every way you can, and no matter how humble your position in life, or how busy your days, you will grow mentally, morally, and spiritually. Learn to take advantage of opportunity. This is the cornerstone of success. Get away from the old idea that opportunity knocks once, and only once at every person's door. Opportunity is knocking all the time. Every moment, every situation, position, and condition of life is an opportunity. Yes, even every calamity, misfortune, and disappointment bring with them compensating opportunities if we are only wise enough to see and take advantage of them. Remember, it does not matter where you are, who you are, or what you are doing, what your heredity, environment, or vocation is. Opportunity is yours. Right where you are is a splendid place to begin to build a strong, harmonious, and winning personality. The Inspirational Living Podcast is a production of The Living Hour. For free transcripts, please visit livinghour.org. To get 30% off our Majesty program, please go to livinghour.org forward slash majesty and use the coupon code INSPIRATION. Thanks for listening. I look forward to talking with you next time. Welcome to the Inspirational Living Podcast. Some of you have contacted me recently with questions about using the Majesty program. I therefore would like to let everyone know that I've recently posted a frequently asked questions page to the Living Hour website. To read this fax page or learn more about the Majesty meditation audio, please go to livinghour.org forward slash majesty.
If you haven't bought the program yet, you can get 30% off the $11.99 purchase price by using the coupon code INSPIRATION. Now on to today's reading, which was edited and adapted from the book Successes for You by Dorothy Quigley, published in 1899. How can one be cheerful when life is so tragic, you ask? When life is so serious and there is so much sadness, how can one be joyful? Well, if life is tragic to you, perhaps you have made it so. Perhaps you have made no effort to understand yourself, and, unstable as water, you have been swayed by every changing circumstance, every whim, and every impulse, becoming a victim instead of a master of your emotions. Perhaps unawares you have been so supremely selfish and exacting that you have demanded too much of others and have exhausted their interest, love, and patience. Perhaps you have allowed yourself to be deceived although you have every power within you to aid you in reading your fellow beings aright. Perhaps you have put false values on wealth and social position. Perhaps you have forgotten that all of us, like polygons, have several sides, and you have not taken the trouble to see some apparently unkind relative or associate from every point of view. Many a high-minded but exacting wife expects her husband to live up to her theories instead of the highest and best in himself, and she makes no effort to discover the highest and best in him, to help nourish and show it forth. Likewise, many a husband forms a character mold for his wife to fit into, without trying to tenderly learn the real nature of his companion. He exacts from her what his preconceived idea of her, his caricature of her, would do and say. Affection cannot thrive under such treatment, and many an exacting husband and wife have thus created their own sorrow. Perhaps you have been too self-sacrificing. As has been shown, ignoble self-sacrifice is as bad, sometimes worse, than exacting selfishness, because it develops selfishness in others and makes one negative and powerless to hold and attract the most dignified, ennobling, and enduring kind of love. You may say, how can anyone be cheerful when death is omnipresent? It requires our strongest, highest effort to face the desolation and loneliness that follow in the track of death. May we not hope that anything so universal as death must be beneficial? May we not trust, as we watch the workings of nature, that death is but another condition of life? Despite the unspeakable sadness that wrecks our own hearts, we at least should not grieve selfishly. Many a mourner grieves in a self-pitying way, Passionate grief neither does the dead any good, nor the living. It does the latter harm. Death is the Messiah that redeems us from brutal unkindness and all uncharitableness. Without death and little children, what would not the world lack in gentleness, loving kindness, and sweetness? There is sadness, there is misery. But to be sad and miserable only increases the weight of woe in the world. Your wailings do harm. You can lessen the great sum of misery by making yourself such a sunny, serenely poised presence that wherever you move, you will radiate brightness. You will diffuse sweetness, strength, and light. Try to see how the laws of nature work and be an optimist. Be a liberal, tolerant one. The jokester says, a pessimist is one who has met an optimist. 
That's a fine hint not to make your optimism too ill-advised, too belligerent. You will hear the unreflecting say, the optimist is a fool. The pessimist understands life, gets below the surface of things, hears the ceaseless murmur of woe through all the immemorial years. Sing back to them, no, the optimist is the wise person, the pessimist is the fool. The pessimist is worse because they are a moral and mental poisoner. They paralyze energy, judge only by defects, the lowest form of judgment, and have not the mental penetration to understand the workings of nature's laws. The pessimist looks at Niagara Falls and says, useless sheet of water, thundering noisily, Lots of people dashed to pieces in the whirlpool below. Water everlastingly flowing. And adds self-pityingly, It will be tumbling over these precipices when I'm dead and gone. However, the optimist looks at the falls joyfully. They see in it a tremendous object lesson of nature's immutable laws. They understand if they work in harmony with these unchangeable laws, they will serve us, and proceeds to use Niagara to light a city. If the optimist is a fool, who would be wise? If you are a miserable, despondent, unsuccessful individual, get hold of yourself this instant. First, get yourself into the condition for success. If possible, have a room of your own into which you can go and preserve the sacred and uninterrupted seclusion that would be granted you if you were meditating or saying your prayers. If you cannot have a place, choose an hour at night or early in the morning when you may be sure of being undisturbed. If you are despondent, train your mind to be hopeful. If you have no pleasant experiences in your life to recall, Imagine the pleasantest things you would like to have happen to you, or you would like to do. Picture yourself in a commanding attitude, full of courage and brightness. See your face as radiant with cheerfulness as you can imagine it. Look in the glass and catch your expression. Recall these thoughts, quicken the emotions and sensations of hope and courage. Go over and over them with the steady persistency of a student bent on learning a difficult foreign language. Soon your brain cells, nerved with new thoughts, energized with an inspiriting inflow of positive thought force, will work for themselves, and your will 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 you to think in currents of hopeful and courageous thoughts and you will view life from a newer and higher plane and see opportunities you never saw before. Your cheerfulness and courage will add warmth to your manners. You will grow more winning unawares. A gracious manner full of hospitality and cheerful composure suggests self-poise, self-respect, and self-command, qualities that we all admire. Do not despise the forms and rules of polite society. Learn them, master them. They aid our dealing in conversation, as a railway aids traveling, by getting rid of all avoidable obstructions of the road, and leaving nothing to be conquered but pure space. After you have acquired mental and physical poise, and have energized your despondent heart with courage and cheerfulness, Project clearly and definitely in a mental vision what you wish to accomplish. Go over it, just as you went over the thoughts of hope, courage, and cheerfulness, and persist until your will wills you to work steadily, forcefully, and courageously. Permeate, magnetize your room, your office, with emanations of success, of hope, of courage, and concentration. Create a vitalizing atmosphere of success so that whenever you enter your sanctum, you will be uplifted and encouraged. Entertain no thoughts of failure, 
no forebodings of defeat, no distrust in your powers of accomplishment, no matter how frequently and forcefully they attempt to intrude. Make your atmosphere so tingle with faith, hope, courage, and cheer that everyone that comes to you will have their confidence in you strengthened, will be cheered and stimulated, and convinced that you are the sort to be trusted with business or professional enterprises. Concentrate with unwavering effort on whatever you do. Remember, if you go to a hectic workplace with your thoughts in a chaotic state, you will ally yourself with all the chaos and irresolution round about you. If you are a magnet of sufficient power, you attract to yourself thought forces, just as the positive, sympathetic piece of silver draws all the particles of invisible silver to itself from the water. This is not nonsense. You can notice for yourself that a person who goes to their work with a trained mind, who has methodized sense memories of business, and who is alert and energetic, is a positive force that attracts stimulating thought out of the everywhere. That person proves the truth of the old saying, firmly drive, firmly draw. They stir vibrations of healthy, hopeful energy and quicken confidence in everyone they meet. The conditions they thus awaken react upon themselves. Professional investors, for example, quicken the commercial feeling in the minds of others and focus their thoughts on finance. They believe in themselves and make other people believe in them. Their very spirit of adventure is a conquering force. Financiers rarely have divided interests and therefore reap the benefit of their loyalty. Loyalty is a spiritual quality, and even in its least commendable form, it is not without magnetism. A person longing to be an artist, a writer, a scientist, or a musician goes to the city often with less concentrated attracting force than the one who wishes to succeed in business. Many of these dreamers go through life becoming neither successful tradespeople nor artists. If you are dissatisfied with what you do, you have less power of attracting successful conditions than if you loved your work. Love is magnetic wherever and however it is expressed. If you dislike your work, challenge yourself and find out justly and squarely why you do. Determine whether it is laziness, false pride, or lack of ability on your part that makes it irksome to you. If your work is so uncompromisingly uncongenial that you are doing yourself physical, mental, and spiritual harm by pursuing it, leave it, for as the French novelist Paul Bourget once said, there is for every soul an atmosphere of ideas which is appropriate to it and outside of which it cannot endure for any long time. If you are fearless and energetic, you can do the work you like or a phase of it. I once knew a woman who longed to be an artist and painter, but could not spend the time and money necessary to become one, so she became an artistic photographer. The composition, grouping, and posing in her pictures were unusual. In the photographs, there was a singular charm, not unsuggestive of an ideal creation of an artist and painter. Get into your right cycle. Others have done so with success, and you can too, if you are willing to suffer a few deprivations and inconveniences for a time. I once knew a man who wished to be a lawyer but had to slave at newspaper work. One day he decided that he would study law. He very properly tried to arrange his work in time so he could do so, and obtained a night desk upon a daily newspaper. He thus secured time to attend the law school and to study law during the day. He bravely continued in his dual role of editor and law student until he was admitted to practice, 
and successfully established himself in his chosen profession. If it is utterly impossible for you to give up the uncongenial work you are doing, get into harmony with it. Every rebellious thought concerning it depletes your force. As you dissipate your force, you may observe that you become pasty-looking, negative and unattractive, pitiable and repellent. Master your work. Others have done so. You can too. Do you not see that it all lies with you whether you succeed or not? The uplifting, helpful, and successful effects of this philosophy have been proven over and over again by common sense folk. Prove it for yourself. Make yourself over. If a dog can be given more brain power, a human being certainly can too. Heart power, brain power, and spirit power form an invincible trinity to redeem you from despair and failure. As the old saying goes, never mind ridicule, never mind defeat. Up again, old heart. Remember, my friend, every obstacle is a stepping stone to the one who knows the law of nature and of thought. We are not alone in the struggle. Even the flowers have to make an effort to reach the sunlight. Properly directed effort generates energy. Energy is life. Life is the manifestation of the spirit. Give your spirit room to express itself. Use the forces within you intelligently, fearlessly, joyously, triumphantly, persistently, and you will succeed. The Inspirational Living Podcast is a production of The Living Hour. For free transcripts, please go to livinghour.org. If you would like to support our podcast and the work we do, you can become a patron for as little as a dollar a month. To become a patron, please go to patreon.com. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com. And do a quick search for the Inspirational Living Podcast. Thanks for listening. I look forward to talking with you next time. Welcome to the Inspirational Living Podcast. If you are among the hundreds of listeners who have purchased our Majesty Self-Development program, you might find today's podcast of particular interest because it helps explain the transformational power of gratitude and joy, mental states which play essential roles in our seven key affirmations for self-growth. To learn more about the Majesty program, please visit livinghour.org forward slash majesty. To get 30% off your purchase, use the coupon code INSPIRATION. Now on to today's reading, which was edited and adapted from Thinking for Results by Christian D. Larson, published in 1912. The attitude of aspiration causes us to think of the marvels that lie beyond present achievement and thereby inspires the creation of great thoughts. There must be great thoughts before the mind can become great, and the mind must become great before great results can be secured. Aspiration concentrates attention upon superiority and therefore elevates all the qualities of the mind into that state. This being true, Every effort in life should be directed towards those possibilities that lie beyond our present achievements if we wish to cultivate and strengthen an attitude of aspiration. When we are simply ambitious, we proceed as we are and seek to make a mark for ourselves with what power we already possess. But when we are alive with the spirit of aspiration, 
we seek to make ourselves larger, more powerful, and far superior to what we are now, knowing that a great light cannot be hid, and that anyone with great power must invariably reach the goal they have in view. The ambitious mind seeks to make a small light shine far beyond its capacity, and through this effort finally wears itself out. The aspiring mind, however, seeks to make the light larger and larger, knowing that the larger the light becomes, the further it will shine, and that no strenuous efforts will be required to push its powerful rays into effectiveness. When the attitude of aspiration looks beyond the personal self, it does not necessarily look outside of the self. The purpose of aspiration is to enter into the possession of the marvels of the great within, because what is found in the within will be expressed in the without. Therefore, when we constantly rise above the personal self, we perpetually enlarge the personal self thus gaining the capacity to accomplish more and more until we finally accomplish practically everything we have in view. An attitude of aspiration, therefore, should never leave the mind for a moment. We should, on the contrary, keep the mental eye focused upon the boundless possibilities that are within us and deeply desire with heart and soul a greater and greater realization of those possibilities in practical life. The attitude of contentment may truthfully be said to be the twin sister of aspiration, and its important function is to prevent aspiration from losing sight of what has already been gained. When contentment is absent, the present seems more or less barren, and when aspiration is absent, the present seems sufficient. But the present is never barren, nor is it ever sufficient. The present is rich with many things of extreme value, if we only train ourselves to see them. These things, however, are not enough for the advancing soul. Greater things are at hand and it is our privilege to press on through the realization of those greater things. We must therefore conclude that the best attitude of mind is to be content with things as they now are, and at the same time, reach out constantly for greater things. When contentment is absent, the present is not fully utilized, and we cannot attain greater things until we have fully employed what has already been received. When aspiration is absent, the present is used over and over again like the air in a closed room, and the result is mental stagnation, to be followed by failure and final extinction. When we look at this subject from another point of view, we find that the mind that is not content cannot be developed, nor can such a mind make the best use of the powers it may now possess. Every moment, therefore, should be filled with contentment and perfect satisfaction, and every moment should also be filled with a strong desire for still greater achievements. In such a mental state, where contentment and aspiration are combined, we shall find life to be a continual feast, each course being more delicious than the last. We shall also find such a life to be the path to perpetual growth and continuous joy. To cultivate a state of contentment, we should live in the conviction that all things are working together for good, and that what is best for us now is coming to us now. The truth is that if we are trying to make all things work together for good and live in the faith that we can, we actually will so order things in our life that all things will work together for good, and what comes to us every day will be the very best for us that day. 
When we live, think, and act in this manner, we shall soon find that the best is daily coming to us, and that the best of each day is better than that of the day before. The result will be perfect contentment, and the placing of life in that position where it can receive, in the great eternal now, all that the great eternal now has to give. In short, when we so live that we permit the present moment to be filled with all the riches that it can hold, then we shall have the contented mind, and the ever-growing mind, the mind that is proverbially described as a continuous feast. The attitude of gratitude is closely related to that of contentment, and is one of the greatest of all mental states, and the reason why is found in the fact that no mind can be right, nor think constructively, unless it is filled with the spirit of gratitude. The fact is that new life is coming to us every day, and with it, new opportunities. Every moment, therefore, is richer than the one before. But if this coming of new life and new opportunities does not add to the richness and value of our own personal life, there is a lack of gratitude. And where gratitude is lacking, the mind is more or less closed to the many good things that are coming our way. The grateful mind, however, is always an open mind, open to the newer, the higher and the better, and therefore invariably coming into possession of more and more of those things. The entire human race is moving forward with the stream of continuous advancement. Better things, therefore, are daily coming into the life of each individual. If we do not receive them, the reason is that our mind is more or less closed on account of the lack of gratitude. So let us remember that the mind must be grateful for everything in order to be open to the reception of new things and better things. We simply cannot receive better things unless we are truly grateful for that which we already possess. This is the law in this matter, and it is a law that will stand up to the most rigid analysis. To give thanks, therefore, with the whole heart for everything that comes into life, and to express constant and whole-souled gratitude to all the world for everything that is good in the world, this is the secret through which we may open the mind to the great cosmic influx, that influx that is bringing into the life of every individual the richness and the power that a complete life as in store for every individual. But in order to be grateful in the best and most perfect manner, we must have appreciation. We must be able to see the real worth of that which comes into life before we can express the fullness and the spirit of the grateful heart. The attitude of appreciation is also valuable in another direction. When we appreciate worth, we always gain a higher consciousness of worth, and thereby make our own minds more worthy. To cultivate the mental state of appreciation, we should eliminate all tendency to fault-find, criticize, and the like, and we should make a special effort to see the worthy qualities in everything and everybody with which we come in contact. The result of such a practice will not only be a better appreciation with a deeper insight into the superior qualities of life, but also the building of a more wholesome mind. Realizing the value of appreciation, we should, whenever we discover a lack of appreciation in ourselves, proceed at once to remove the cause. We shall not hesitate in doing this when we find that a lack of appreciation also tends to give the mind a false view of things, thereby preventing the acquisition of the best that life has in store. The appreciative mind has a natural tendency to look upon the better side of things, but this tendency becomes complete 
only when the optimistic attitude is added. To be optimistic does not mean to think that black is white, or that everything everywhere is all right. The true optimist can also see the flaws and the imperfections in life. But he or she gives direct attention to the good side, the better side, and the strong side. And having this larger view, they always know that the strong side is much larger and far superior to the weak side. The optimist therefore never becomes discouraged because they know that failure and wrong are only temporary and that the right finally wins every time. In addition, they know that they can aid the right to such an extent that the victory can be gained now. The pessimist lives in the false and does not see things as they are. Their conclusions are therefore worthless. For this reason, we should never pay any attention to the words of the pessimist, as we shall be misled in every instance if we do. Instead, we should listen to the prophecy of the optimist, and then put all our ability and all our faith into the possibilities of that prophecy, thereby making it come true. The value of the optimistic attitude in scientific thinking, therefore, is very great, because to think correctly on any subject, the mind must have the mountaintop view, and we must think correctly if we wish to think for results. Though the optimist may live on the sunny side, still the full value of life's sunshine cannot be gained until we add the attitude of constant cheerfulness. To be cheerful, bright, happy, and joyous is absolutely necessary if we wish to think scientifically, think constructively, and think for results. When we proceed to think for results, we think for a purpose. We employ correctly the constructive mental processes so that we may work ourselves up to the goal in view. Growth and development, therefore, must take place all along the line of action, but no mental growth can take place without mental sunshine. Accordingly, we should resolve to be happy no matter what may transpire. We cannot afford to be otherwise. Sunshine will melt the most massive iceberg if the rays are direct and the clouds are kept away. And it is the same in daily life. No matter how cold, disagreeable, and uncongenial your present environment may be, plenty of mental sunshine can change it all. It pays to be happy. Cheerfulness is a most profitable investment, and there are no riches that are greater than constant joy. This attitude is not for the few or for occasional moments, because all the sunny states of mind can be made permanent in a short time by a very simple process. Make it a practice to go to sleep every night with cheerfulness on your mind and with a feeling of joy in every atom of your being. Through this practice you will carry the cheerful idea into the subconscious and gradually the joyous state will become an established state in the subconscious mind. The result will be that the subconscious will express cheerfulness and wholesomeness at all times, and it will become second nature for you to have a sweet disposition, a sunny frame of mind, and an attitude of perpetual joy. This method may seem to be too simple to be of value but the simplest methods are usually the best, and anyone can prove through a few weeks of trial that this method will produce the desired results, and will, through more continuous practice, actually transform mind and disposition to such an extent that the mind will henceforth live in constant mental sunshine. There are few things that are more important than this, if we wish to train the mind in those attitudes that bring success to our personal and professional lives.
The Inspirational Living Podcast is a production of The Living Hour. For free transcripts, please visit livinghour.org. To get 30% off our Majesty program, please go to livinghour.org forward slash majesty and use the coupon code INSPIRATION. Thanks for listening. I look forward to talking with you next time. Welcome to the Inspirational Living Podcast. If you enjoy our podcast, please spread the word by telling a friend or sharing your favorite episode on Facebook. We also would love it if you could leave us a review at the iTunes Store, Google Play, or Stitcher.com. I always appreciate hearing back from you and knowing this podcast has had a positive impact on your life. Thank you. Today's reading was edited and adapted from A Book of Friendly Thoughts by Nixon Waterman, published in 1913. Who among us can presume to estimate the value of a joyful heart? What a perpetual blessing it is to its possessor, and to all who must come into close relationship with the owner of it. There is nothing more pleasantly catching than happiness. The happy person serves to make all who are about them the more happy. What the bright, inspiring sunshine adds to the beauty of the fields, a happy disposition adds to the charm of all the incidents and experiences of one's daily life. Do not you who listens to me now, Love to associate with a friend possessing a cheerful disposition? And do you not intuitively refrain from meeting with the unfortunate one, whose looks and words are heavy with complaining, or whose eyes fail to see the beauty of the world lying all about? If we are given to wise thinking, we must reach the conclusion that as we regard these attributes in others, so others must regard them in us. Nothing is more eloquent than a joyful face. It is the open sesame to all our hearts. A sunshiny face melts away all opposition and finds the word welcome written over the doorways where the face that wears a hard, unfriendly look sees only the warning, no admittance. A smile that is only skin deep is not a true smile, but only a superficial grin. A true smile comes all the way from the heart. It bears its message of goodwill and friendliness. It is a mute salutation of good luck and happy days to you, and it makes whoever receives it better and stronger for the hour. The genuine smile is closely related to, and is a part of, that laughter which beams and sparkles in the eye, and makes the little cheerful smiling lines in the face that are so quickly and easily distinguished from the lines that are the outward sign of an unhappy spirit within. Many centuries ago, that wise and admirable philosopher, Epictetus, discovered that happiness is not in strength, or wealth, or power, or all three. It lies in ourselves, in true freedom, in the conquest of every ignoble fear, in perfect self-government, in a power of contentment and peace, in the even flow of life, even in poverty, exile, disease, in the very valley of the shadow. One of the happiest observers of life and its higher purposes, Anne Gilchrist, says, I used to think it was great to disregard happiness, 
to press to a high goal while being careless and disdainful of it. But now I see there is nothing so great as to be capable of happiness, to pluck it out of each moment, and whatever happens, to find that one can ride as gay and buoyant on the angry, menacing, tumultuous waves of life, as on those that glide and glitter under a clear sky, that it is not defeat and wretchedness which comes out of the storms of adversity, but strength and calmness. The strongest incentive for the cultivation of a joyful heart is that it is a duty as well as a delight. Sidney Smith has very wisely observed that humankind is always happier for having been happy, so that if you make others happy now, you make them happy twenty years hence by the memory of it. True happiness has about it no suggestion of selfishness. The genuinely happy person is the one who would have all the world happy. Father Faber asks, Is there any happiness in the world like the happiness of a disposition made happy by the happiness of others? There is no joy to be compared with it. The luxuries which wealth can buy, the rewards which ambition can obtain, the pleasures of art and scenery, the abounding sense of health and the exquisite enjoyment of mental creations, are nothing to this pure and heavenly happiness, where self is drowned in the blessings of others. One of the most heavenly attributes of happiness is that it begets more happiness, not only in ourselves, but in others about us. It has in it an uplift and a strength that enables us to build the stronger today against the distress that will beset us tomorrow. Health and happiness are terms that are often closely linked in our speech and in our literature. One is almost a synonym for the other. Perhaps the true significance that exists between the two would be more correctly stated were we to reverse the form in which they are usually set forth and say happiness and health instead. All observers of human nature and its many complex attributes are convinced that happiness is the fountain spring of health. Charles Newcomb, one of our keenest students of life, tells us that small annoyances are the seeds of disease. We cannot afford to entertain them. They are the bacteria, the germs that make serious disturbance in the bodily system and prepare the way for all derangements. They furnish the mental conditions which are manifested later in the blood, the tissues and the organs under various pathological names. Good thoughts are good medicine. We must kill our resentment and regret, impatience and anxiety. Health will inevitably follow. Every thought that holds us, even in the slightest degree to either anticipation or regret, hinders to some extent the realization of our present good. It limits freedom. Life is in the present tense. Its significant name is being. Whether we are happy or not depends much on our point of view. The disposition to look at everything through kind and beautiful eyes makes all the world more kind and beautiful. If we are gloomy within, the whole world appears likewise. Since our happiness is merely the reflex influence of the happiness we make for others, it would seem as though the joy of our lives dwells within our own keeping. The universe, says Zimmerman, pays every person in their own coin. If you smile, it smiles upon you in return. If you frown, you will be frowned at. If you sing, you will be invited into merry company. If you think, you will be entertained by thinkers. 
If you love the world and earnestly seek for the good therein, you will be surrounded by loving friends, and nature will pour into your lap the treasures of the earth. All of this being true, we must early learn to seize upon opportunities for making others happy if we ourselves will get the most and highest enjoyment from life. Charles Hargrove says, Brother, sister, your mistake is to live alone in a crowded world, to think always of yourself, your own belongings and problems, instead of realizing that you are a member of a great human society and that your true interests are one with those of the world which will go on much the same, however it fare with you. Live the larger life and you will find it the happier. So, one of the chief aims of your life and of mine should be to find happiness and to see to it that others find it as well. And let us not wait to find happiness in one great offering, but let us discover it whenever and wherever we can. Let us carefully study our surroundings to see if it is not hiding all about us. Nothing can do more to add to our happiness of mind than to cultivate the gracious habit of being grateful for joys that come to us and to seek to appreciate the worth of the beneficent gifts that are ever being showered upon us. We are so apt to fall into the habit of accepting blessings as a matter of course and of failing to discover their wonderful value. How many of us, for example, have ever thoughtfully dwelled upon the priceless attributes of the air that is ever and always floating about us? In order that we may have a truer appreciation of the air's fine qualities and purposes, let us read these words by Lord Avebury. Fresh air, how wonderful it is. It permeates all our body. It bathes the skin in a medium so delicate that we are not conscious of its presence. And yet it is so strong that it wafts the odors of flowers and fruit into our rooms, carries our ships over the seas. It is the vehicle of sound. It brings to us the voices of those we love and the sweet music of nature. It is the great reservoir of the rain which waters the earth. It softens the heat of day and the cold of night, covers us overhead with a glorious arch of blue, and lights up the morning and evening skies with fire. It is so exquisitely soft and pure, so gentle and yet so useful, that no wonder Ariel is the most delicate lovable and fascinating of all nature's spirits. It is only when we open our eyes to the beauty of the wonders about us that we see how much there is to contribute to our happiness if we will but open our hearts and let it come in. What a perpetual exaltation nature will afford us when we have cultivated the fine habit of looking upon it with welcoming eyes. So let us cultivate the fine habit of finding joy and of shouting it out to our friends and neighbors. Life seems bright to us when we are truly glad of anything, and we let gladness have a voice to express itself. George MacDonald says, A poet is someone who is glad of something and tries to make other people glad of it too. In the possession of this kindly spirit, at least, we must all strive to be poets. Assume a virtue if you have it not, says Shakespeare. Well, as a rule, it is deemed wrong to assume to possess any virtue that we do not possess. We may, and no doubt should, at times, appear to be happy even though we may feel more like indulging in lamentations. To come to the breakfast or dinner table enumerating a list of real or imaginary grievances 
is a most ill-advised thing to do. We should endeavor to forget our troubles, and above all, we should be slow to give voice to them, so that thereby they won't be multiplied in the minds of others. Instead of displaying the flag of distress and surrender, the wiser method is to pull our courage and determination together and don the better armor. If through thick and through thin, you are eager to win, don't go shrouded in fear and in doubt, but with hope and with truth and the blue sky of youth, go through life with the sunny side out. Let it be determined between us, right here and now, that come what may, we shall each of us endeavor to keep a joyful heart and a pleasant face. As we love to see a happy expression on the faces of our parents, brothers, sisters, and friends, so must they enjoy seeing a pleasant look over spreading our own features. And with this good and kindly resolve in our minds, it will never be difficult for us to decide whether we shall give to the good world about us the gladness or the gloom that is embodied in a song or a sigh. If you were a burr and shut in a cage, what would be better to do? Would you grieve your throat with a sorry note and mourn the whole day through? Or would you swing and chirp and sing, though the world were warped with wrong? till you filled one place with the perfect grace and gladness of your song. The Inspirational Living Podcast is a production of The Living Hour and brought to you by the generous financial support of our patrons. Become our patron for as little as $3 a month to gain access to free transcripts and the series Our Sunday Talks, which features thought-provoking readings on spirituality and spiritual growth. Thanks for listening. I look forward to talking with you next time. Welcome to the Inspirational Living Podcast. If you are looking for some inspiring, life-changing beach reading for this summer, don't forget to check out our book, Evergreen, 50 Inspirational Life Lessons. Purchase your copy today at inspirationallifelessons.com. Today's reading has been edited and adapted from the book, How Success is Won, by Bernard McFadden, published in 1904. Life's greatest hurdles are encountered in our struggle for success. Though there are a few general principles that can be used as a guide, no person can tell another exactly how to succeed. Each one must work out their own salvation in this regard. The great successes are achieved by bringing out individual capacity or talents. Human beings who simply work by rule, who can only transmit that which has been impressed upon them by others, can never attain more than ordinary success. It is by developing one's personality, by bringing out your individual characteristics, that superior abilities are attainable. Some say that I have been successful. Early in life I determined to accomplish certain results, and to a limited extent I have succeeded. Even greater successes, I believe, are still in store for me. I am indebted to no school or college. I was educated in the school of experience. It is there that we learn lessons that are indelibly impressed upon our minds 
and this practical knowledge is needed every day of our lives. There is entirely too much theory in the ordinary methods of preparing human beings to cope with life's realities. The value of so-called higher education as a means of preparing one for life's great work is indeed to be questioned, unless it is taken with a full understanding of its deficiencies. I started with nothing but a strong determination. At first I did not even have health, and because finally I was able to do the work outlined in my early ambitions, my life has been called a success. Many talk of this as though it were unusual, but the greatest successes are always attained by those who must struggle from the lowliest beginnings. It is only by beginning in this manner that we are able to develop the abilities that are essential in the making of a great success. If one desires to reach the top of a high mountain, you do not attempt to jump to the summit in one leap. You climb slowly, step by step. If your efforts are expended temperately and wisely, your strength increases as you ascend. The difficulties you meet develop the strength, courage, and determination that are needed to cope with the greater difficulties that are to come. When you start at the bottom, with no backer and no capital, you are in the primary class of that great school of experience. There you have all the opportunities in the world to develop. That practical school called experience sends forth no graduates. The school term never ends. It is continuous from childhood to death, and it is only those who are able to learn its great and valuable lessons who truly succeed. The whole world is before you, Life is exactly what you make it. If gifted with health and strength and an ordinary degree of intelligence, you are your own master. You can mold and develop yourself mentally and physically according to your own individual desires. My message today is sent forth with the hope that it will enthuse you who are struggling at the bottom of the ladder of life and that it may help you to understand that the greatest rewards are easily within reach of those who are willing to struggle on persistently with a definite and unswerving aim continuously in view. In the strongest terms, I want to emphasize the importance of interest in your work. I maintain that without it, success was never achieved by anyone. The one straight road to success is to learn to love your business. You can do best that which you love best. If you have started in a business which you cannot learn to love, then you should go into some other business. You will never succeed in our age of competition unless you can find real pleasure in your work. The mere making of money is not a sufficient incentive. You must find your highest enjoyment in the task itself. No person who works along that line can fade. That is my judgment based on my own experience and observation. Determination, persistence, attention to detail, in fact, nearly every necessary characteristic in accomplishing results in any sphere of life depends upon love for your work. Learn to love your work and don't be a laggard in love. Let that sentence ring in your ears day after day, year after year, as you struggle towards life's great goal, success and remember to immediately make a change if you are unable to love your work. Do not become a machine, a mere mechanical device that works in an aimless fashion, accomplishing only essential duties and losing all thought for the future. 
Put your personality, your brains, your complete energies into your endeavors. You must be able to so concentrate your efforts as actually to become absorbed. There can be no concentration, there can be no material advance, until your interest is aroused. The person who can lose themselves in their work is the one who will succeed best. Life is to a certain extent like the games we play in our youth. The occupation you select is a great game that lasts all through life, and your success absolutely depends on how intensely interested you can become. No matter what may be the nature of your occupation, arouse some interest in it. Try to do it better than your colleagues or competitors. Try to devise some means whereby the work may be performed more quickly, easily, or effectively. Use your brains, no matter how your time may be occupied. Brains are useful in any sphere of life, even in digging ditches. The drill, plow, the backhoe were all devised by laboring people who use their brains, by individuals interested in their work. If you are engaged in an occupation in which you cannot become interested, make a change quickly. Do not consider the matter for a day. Stop at the earliest possible moment and search for something that will interest you. You may lose for the time being. You may have to suffer because of such a hasty action, but in the end you will be magnificently rewarded. Search for interesting work, for interesting work really means play, means ability on your part to concentrate your every effort in your chosen field. Success never was attained under any other circumstances. It has often been said that life is just what we make it. Though this may be an exaggeration, Usually we are the makers of our own joys and sorrows. Laugh and the world laughs with you. Weep and you weep alone, is a quotation that has been repeated again and again. It contains a world of truth. It teaches also a valuable lesson to the individual. Your troubles assume the importance that you give them. No more, no less. If you are inclined to laugh them off, if you make light of them, they will affect you lightly. Stop making mountains out of molehills. If you have any troubles, laugh them off. Make light of them. Don't allow yourself to be blue and glum because of their influence. The problems they present will be more difficult to solve under such circumstances. Cultivate the laughing habit. Get all the joy from life you can. Some very dignified individuals imagine that it shows a lack of refinement to laugh heartily. Don't be a dignified fool. Throw dignity to the winds and cultivate the laughing habit. And above all, laugh when none but yourself knows how much quiet heroism there is in the outburst. But just the same, don't ever, under any circumstances, pet yourself with the notion that you are a hero. If the world doesn't discover your heroism, let the world remain in ignorance. Lastly, let me remind you that character must stand behind and back up everything you do. Many people may question the truth of the claim that true success must have a basis of unswerving integrity. These cynics or doubters will point to so-called successful men and women who possess little or no integrity, to those whose greedy natures are insatiable, and who care but little by what means they satisfy their grasping desires. But this is not true success. It does not bring satisfaction. It does not mean happiness. 
Those who are capable of stooping to such methods are narrow in mind and stunted in conscience, and full and complete happiness can never stir their souls. Honesty pays an actual business investment. Not only does it pay because of the personal satisfaction that it brings, because of the increased happiness that comes with a free conscience, but it pays financially. No matter what your desires may be, in order to be successful, you must adhere for a long period to a particular kind of work. You must continue your efforts in one special sphere. If you are dishonest, this is difficult. With some careless employers, detection may be deferred for a long time, but it must come. And when it does appear, you are compelled to move on and start again at the bottom. There may be occasions when a dishonest act will enable you to reap a rich reward. I care not how much you may gain financially by this divergence from the path of rectitude. You have sold yourself cheaply. No price can adequately compensate you for your loss. The reputation for unswerving integrity, to have it known that you are beyond price, that you cannot be bought, that you will not be turned aside a hairbreadth for a dishonest financial reward, is a capital so high in value that it cannot be measured. Start out in your life work with strong convictions, firm principles. Let no experience deter you from your belief in the ultimate value of following to the closest detail the path along which they lead. If you possess the capacity for happiness, if you possess the principles of true manhood or womanhood and commit a crime against the dictates of your conscience, but little mental satisfaction remains for you thereafter. If you have been able to crush out all that is best in your nature, if that particular element of your character called conscience has been eliminated, may heaven pity you, for you are the dross of the world. The hog that wallows in the mire possesses superior characteristics to the human being who goes through life without high principles for a guide. It makes not a particle of difference whether you are a factory worker, salesperson, business manager, or waiter. You should start in life with unswerving determination to be just and honest to all. It actually pays in the end to follow out the golden rule of doing unto others as you would have them do unto you. For then the true principles that lead to real success, to the satisfying happiness that no amount of money can ever buy, are surely within your reach. Success that is true and satisfying comes only with honesty of purpose. Make your convictions strong. Stand by them. Fight for them. Unswerving integrity will make a foundation for your career as hard and immovable as adamantine. And though you may struggle in the darkness for a time, never for one moment doubt that light shines for you ahead. Success, real, true success, must ultimately be yours. If a physical foundation is added to your unswerving purposes, you cannot fail. For with constant endeavor and the clearness of mind that comes to those who are fully alive and alert and awake, the glimmers of light in the form of opportunity will be in every case clearly discerned. Success comes to those whose efforts are diligent and continuous to those who are guided by strong convictions, firm purposes, and unswerving integrity. Let your ambitions, your enthusiasms, your life be guided in this manner, and you will rise and ultimately accomplish your desires. 
you will reap the rewards of your efforts with absolute certainty. The Inspirational Living Podcast is brought to you by the kind financial support of listeners like you. To help us continue and grow our podcast, please become a sponsor today. You can support us for the cost of a cup of coffee a month. Learn more at livinghour.org forward slash sponsor. Thanks for listening. I look forward to talking with you next time. Welcome to the Inspirational Living Podcast, brought to you in part by Book of Zen, makers of wearable inspiration and gift ideas. Today's podcast has been edited and adapted from How to Get On by Bernard Feeney, published in 1891. If you were about to get a house built, you would naturally go to an architect, tell them in a general way what kind of house you required, and then inform them how much money you intended to spend on it. The architect would probably take some time to consider how your ideas and wishes were to be carried out. They would spoil some sheets of paper and sketching plans, each coming nearer and nearer to include and reconcile all your conditions. At last, they would strike on one requiring no more corrections. Here is the ground plan of your house. Here the front, side, rear elevations. Here is your drawing room. There your dining room. Here your office, your kitchen and pantry. There on the upper stories, your bedrooms, bathrooms, etc. And the cost of the whole is kept within the amount you specified. The plan is complete you are delighted with it, and you give orders for the immediate execution of the work. Suppose, however, you determine to economize expenses by declining the services of an architect, and you employ a bricklayer to run up four walls with a certain number of holes in them for doors and windows. You then get a roof put on, and you find when you look at the hole that you have spent your money on an ugly, misshapen mass of brick and mortar. Now, character is a kind of house that everyone has to build up around themselves. You must do it, good or bad, refined or coarse, pleasant or unpleasant. Character is always being built up as an essential part of the work of life, ending only when we cease to live. Some pull down in an hour the labor of years, and then they have to begin afresh from the foundation. Some get disgusted with the collapse of their work and build in defiance of every principle of taste and beauty. Others, however, take courage from failure and learn by it to prevent or avoid its causes. These are chiefly the successful builders, whose work is not only a joy and pride in themselves, but a beautiful model to others. A good character is not only pleasant to the owner and to their friends, but today it is also worth, in real financial terms, more than many university diplomas. This is due to the exclusive cultivation of the intellect in our public schools and colleges. In other words, of the unnatural separation of character and education. I do not, however, intend to go into this branch of the subject today. I merely wish to state an undeniable fact that to get on in life, character must be built up carefully and patiently, with judgment and forethought. Just as we must have a detailed plan of any building we intend to erect, 
so too we must have a plan of the moral structure called character, which we build around us, if we wish that structure to be worthy of us. This plan is called an ideal. Everyone has, consciously or unconsciously, some kind of ideal before their mind, but very few, unfortunately, aspire to realize it. We are generally too indolent, too material-minded, to make much effort to become like what we admire as beautiful and good. And so we let ourselves drift down the current, receding daily farther and farther from the bright vision that beckons us to return. There is but one prize worth all the energy of a human soul, and that is a prize which does not depend on the world's favor, and which death cannot snatch from us. The ideal life to which we ought to aspire is one that must make our homes bright and cheerful. It must make everyone, depending on it, as happy as lies in its power to do. It must therefore leave glum looks, business cares, and outside annoyances in general at the hall door, or better still, locked up in the office. It must not be the slave of money-getting or of pleasure-seeking, or even of any overmastering ambition. It should be orderly and self-possessed, trusted for its integrity and fidelity, respected for its genuine nobility, loved for the beautiful harmony and completeness by which it is distinguished. Above all, an abiding sense of soul, sincere and unaffected, should be its very lifeblood, transfusing, energizing, spiritualizing it from its simplest to its most vital action. Everyone should have some such ideal before them, if you wish to get on in life. It will be a safeguard to you against failure. It will be a stimulus to exertion when other motives cease to influence you. It will be the source of much happiness to you and all around you. For I am convinced no one has more real enjoyment in living than those who live for a noble object. And no example can be more cheerful and inspiring to everyone who comes in contact with you. So, if you have not done so already, form a high ideal, suited to your position, to which you may aspire. Keep it always before you, and resolve to do nothing unworthy of it. Let it, however, be not altogether of the earth. Have in it every human element you wish, but let its spirit be divine. No other ideal can purify and elevate life. None else satisfies the soul. An ideal without the spiritual may seem to work while we are plunged in the maddening whirlpool of worldly excitement and pleasure, but in our quiet, solitary moments, it disappoints us. In old age, it disappoints us still more, and at the approach of death, it crumbles into dust like a mummy exposed to light and air. Then. It disappoints us most of all. I must guard you, however, against making one serious mistake in this matter. Do not lose courage if you find you cannot realize your ideal in a week or a month. Keep on with a strong, cheerful, indomitable will, and be assured you are making progress, although you may not perceive it, as long as you do not give up the struggle. Consider the young child who is just learning to walk. If the child is shown some candy or a rocking horse, it will at once try to toddle towards it, even at the risk of several falls along the way. But if you merely hold out your empty hand to them and beckon them to come, the same child will most probably shake their little head and give you plainly to understand that they see no sufficient reason to make the effort. Simple as this fact is, it goes far to explain why and how the successful go about succeeding in life. They keep the end always in view. Their minds constantly dwell on its advantages, its utility, the pleasure or happiness it will bring. 
Every circumstance that can enhance its attractiveness is turned over and over until they are prepared to make any sacrifice to attain it. Part of the striving towards your ideal involves your choice of career. It requires long and prudent reflection to choose a career in life. The reasons for it and against it should be carefully weighed. But when once chosen, the soul should stretch out towards it with all the strength and intensity of its nature. In many cases, no thought of change should ever be allowed to enter the mind. A false start is generally fatal to success, because the energy wasted in turning round and the time lost in beginning afresh, as well as the discouragement of failure, are all elements of weakness. However, better a thousand times a new beginning, when it is possible, than dragging through life the galling chain of an unsuitable vocation or career. I know no slavery more cruel than this, no misery more pitiable. It sours the joys of life, turns hope into despair, and makes earth a sort of incipient hell. Supposing, then, that you have already decided and entered on a career, profession, or calling of any kind, which for some reason you cannot give up, I advise you strongly, if you value your peace of mind and wish to save your life from failure, to seek out all possible reasons for loving that career and becoming attached to it. Drive away all craving for what may not be. Turn your mind from it as from a deadly temptation. Every beginning is hard. You will, no doubt, chaff and fume for a little at the thought that you are bound for life to something sickening and hateful. But we soon adapt ourselves to the inevitable, no matter how disagreeable it be. Habit reconciles us to it, and companionship after a time disposes us in its favor. There is good in everything, even in a career unwisely chosen. But this good has to be found out. It does not always present itself at first view. A piece of quartz is a dull, heavy, unshapen lump of earth. Yet when people came to know its value, they dug deep into the earth and cut their way through rocks and endangered their lives to obtain it. So too with a career. It may be humble, ill-paid, and laborious. It may seem to have no future before it. It may be commonplace and unromantic, as the realities of life generally are. But it is at least honest and independent. It does us well to develop steadiness, love of duty, trustworthiness, all of which helps us to keep our homes bright and cheerful. Were your social position higher and your occupation require little effort, you would never enjoy the luxury of rest in the bosom of your family after a hard day's honest work. In the world of fashion, there is no home life, no domestic happiness, that whirl of party-going and dissipation among the wealthy, which outsiders envy so keenly, is a circle revolving around much unhealthiness and depression. Were you to know all, you would thank God that your lot is not cast in high places. The more you keep looking at the bright side of your place in life, the brighter it will become, and the lighter and easier will seem the duties it imposes. But there is one consideration which, more than all others, outside of supernatural motives, will reconcile you to your position. It is the intrinsic dignity of labor, no matter of what kind it be. Labor is the necessary complement, the culminating perfection of our nature. Its kind is a matter of absolute indifference. It may be skilled or unskilled, mental or bodily, respectable or vile, in the world's estimation. These distinctions are of no account whatever provided the labor be honest and honestly performed. 
we all must thus cultivate a high idea of our work in life, no matter how humble that work may be, and to throw ourselves into it with energy and resolute will, determined to succeed. Let us now see what success consists of, and what should be the characteristics of the determination with which we should strive for it. Success in life does not depend on the world's estimate of your calling or profession. It depends solely on the knowledge or skill you bring to it, on the energy with which you work at it, on the whole soul devotion with which you are absorbed in it. By these means you will build up a character for yourself that becomes daily more and more esteemed and respected by those who come in contact with you. Your word is good as a bond. Your steadiness, fidelity, reliability is never called into question. You are looked up to within your own sphere, by some with envy, by others with admiration. But all agree in regarding you as one who has deservedly attained the highest possible success. Start today. Make your success, unqualified and absolute, a leading feature of the ideal you keep before you. Aim at the small and frequent, rather than the great advances. Remember the lines of Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. We have not wings, we cannot soar, but we have the feet to scale and climb, by slow degrees, by more and more, the lofty summit of our time. In this way, our determination to succeed will be easy and practical, not spasmodic and exhausting, and its results will become visible much sooner than we expect. The Inspirational Living Podcast is a production of The Living Hour. For free transcripts of our podcast, please go to livinghour.org. If you enjoy our podcast, please consider becoming a patron. You can become a patron for as little as a dollar a month, which will ensure that we can continue our podcast for years to come. To become a patron, please visit patreon.com. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n.com. Simply do a quick search for the Inspirational Living Podcast at patreon.com to find our Patreon page and learn more, including the free gifts we offer to every patron. Subscribe to our free podcast today at the iTunes Store, or at Google Play, or at stitcher.com. Thank you for listening. We look forward to being with you next time. Welcome to the Inspirational Living Podcast, brought to you in part by Book of Zen, makers of inspirational fashion and gift ideas. Visit them online at bookofzen.com. Today's podcast has been edited and adapted from Character Building by Booker T. Washington, published in 1902. There are quite a number of divisions into which life can be divided, but for the purposes of today's talk, I am going to speak with you of two, the bright side of life and the dark side. In thought, in talk, in action, I think you will find that you can separate life into these two divisions, the dark side and the bright side, the discouraging side and the encouraging side. You will find, too, that there are two classes of people. There is one class that is schooling itself and constantly training itself to look upon the dark side of life. And there is another class made of people who are, consciously or unconsciously, constantly training themselves to look upon the bright side of life. Now, it is not wise to go too far in either direction. 
A person who schools themselves to see the dark side of life is likely to make a mistake. And the person who schools themselves to look only upon the bright side of life, forgetting all else, is also apt to make a mistake. Even so, I think I am right in saying that persons who accomplish the most in this world, those to whom, on account of their helpfulness, the world looks most for service, who are most useful in every way, are those who are constantly seeing and appreciating the bright side, despite the dark side of life. You will sometimes find two persons who get up in the morning, perhaps a morning that is overcast, a damp, wet, rainy, uninviting morning. And one of these persons will speak of the morning as being gloomy, will speak of the mud puddles about the house, of the rain, and of all the disagreeable features. The second person, the one who has schooled themselves to see the brighter side of life, the beautiful things in life, will speak of the beauties that are in the raindrops, and the freshness of the newly bathed flowers, shrubs, and trees. Notwithstanding the gloomy and general disconsolate appearance of things, this person will find something attractive in the scene outdoors, and will discover something in the gloomy morning that will cheer them up. What is the result of this kind of optimistic attitude? You become an individual whom people will like to see coming near them. An individual to whom people will go for encouragement when the hours are dark, and when everything seems to be discouraging. If you are currently a college student, when you go into a classroom, do not dwell upon any mistakes that you may think you see the teacher make, or upon any weakness in the presentation of the lesson. All teachers make mistakes sometimes, and you may depend upon it that it is an excellent teacher and a person of fine character, who, when he or she has made a mistake, says frankly and plainly, I have made a mistake or I don't know. It takes a very good and a very bright teacher to say I don't know. No teacher knows everything about every subject. A good teacher will say frankly and clearly I don't know. I cannot answer that question. And in turn their students respect them a great deal more for their frankness and honesty. Education is not what a person is able to hold in their head so much as it is what a person is able to find. I believe it was Daniel Webster who said that the truly educated person is not the one who had all the knowledge in their head, but the one who knows where to look for information upon any subject at any time. Each individual who wishes to succeed must get that kind of discipline. They must get such training that they will know where to go and get facts rather than try to train themselves to hold all the facts in their head. In addition to this, they should be constantly looking for the bright, encouraging, and beautiful things in life. It is the weak individual, as a rule, who is constantly calling attention to the other side, to the dark and discouraging things of life. Try to recall and to remember every good thing and every encouraging thing which has come under your observation, whether it has been in the workplace, at home, or in your community at large. No matter where you are, seize hold of the encouraging things with which you come in contact. Remember that it is harmful to form a habit of continually finding fault, of criticizing, of seeing nothing but the weak points in others. Try to get into a frame of mind where you will be constantly seeing and calling attention to the strong and beautiful things which you observe in the life and work of those around you. Grow into the habit of talking about the bright side of life. When you meet a fellow co-worker, friend, or anybody, get into the habit of calling attention to the bright things of life that you have seen, the things that are beautiful, the things that are charming. Just in proportion as you do this, you will find that you will not only influence yourself in the right direction, but that you will also influence others that way.
It is a very bad habit to get into a state of being constantly moody and discouraged, and of making the atmosphere uncomfortable for everybody who comes within ten feet of you. There are some people who are so constantly looking on the dark side of life that they cannot see anything but that side. Everything that comes from their mouths is unpleasant, about this thing and that thing, and they make the whole atmosphere around them unpleasant for themselves and for everybody with whom they come in contact. It is often very easy to influence others in the wrong direction, and to grow into such a moody fault-finding disposition that not only are you miserable and unhappy, but you make everyone with whom you come into contact miserable and unhappy. The persons who live constantly in a fault-finding atmosphere, who see only the dark side of life, become negative characters. They are the people who never go forward. They never suggest a line of activity. They simply live on the negative side of life. But those of us who seek the better, more beautiful things in life cannot afford to grow in such a way. We must go out into the world not as a negative force, but as a strong, positive, helpful force in the world. We will never accomplish the tasks set before us if we go out with a moody, discouraged, fault-finding disposition. To do the most that lies within us, we must go with a heart and head full of hope and faith in the world, believing that there is work for us to do, believing that we are the people to accomplish that work, and the ones who are going to accomplish it. In nine times out of ten, the person who cultivates the habit of looking on the dark side of life is the little person, the miserable person. The one who is weak in mind, heart, and purpose. On the other hand, the person who cultivates the habit of looking on the bright side of life, and who calls attention to the beautiful and encouraging things in life, in nine cases out of ten, is the strong individual, the one whom the world goes for intelligent advice and support. What I am trying to do is get you to see the best things in life. Do not be satisfied with second-hand or third-hand things. Do not be satisfied until you have put yourself into that atmosphere where you can seize and hold on to the very highest and most beautiful things that can be gotten out of life. I want you to go out into the world, not to have an easy time, but to make sacrifices and to help somebody else. Do not think of yourself alone. The more you do to make somebody else happy, the more happiness will you receive in turn. If you want to be happy, if you want to live a contented life, if you want to live a life full of genuine pleasure, do something for somebody else. When you feel unhappy, disagreeable, and miserable, go to someone else who is miserable, and do that person an act of kindness, and you will find that you will be made happy. The miserable persons in this world are the ones whose hearts are narrow and hard. The happy ones are those who have great big hearts. Such persons are always happy. Now this is not to say you won't have difficulties, nor face obstacles and discouragement. You most certainly will. But I would suggest to you that such difficulties, as an element of life, are for a purpose. I do not believe that anything, any element of your lives, is put there without a purpose. I believe that every effort that we are obliged to make to overcome obstacles gives us strength, and also a confidence in ourselves that nothing else can give us. I would ten times rather see someone having a hard struggle, so as to elevate themselves, than to see them having too much money and having everything that they want come to them without any effort on their part. Remember that you are blessed as compared with some people. The man or woman who has money without having had to work for it, who has all the comforts of life without effort, and who saves their own soul, and perhaps the soul of somebody else, is a rare individual, very rare indeed. You may feel it is a curse to be where you are today. 
but if you will make up your mind that you are going to overcome the obstacles and the difficulties that surround you, you will find that in every effort you make to overcome these difficulties, you are growing in strength and confidence. Make up your mind that you are not going to allow anything to discourage you. Make up your mind that in spite of economic hardship, race and color, in spite of the obstacles that surround you, in spite of everything, you are going to succeed in your life and are going to prepare yourself for usefulness to others. Every person who has grown in any degree of usefulness, every person who has grown to distinction, almost without exception, has been a person who has risen by overcoming obstacles, by removing difficulties, by resolving that when they met discouragements, they would not give up. Make up your mind that you are going to overcome every obstacle and that you are not going to let any discouragement overcome you. If you previously have been inclined to be moody and morose, or have been inclined to feel angry that the whole world is against you, that there is no use in trying to elevate yourself, make up your mind that your future is just as bright as that of anybody else. Do this and you will find that you have it in your own power to make your own future, either bright or gloomy, just as you desire. The Inspirational Living Podcast is a production of The Living Hour. For free transcripts of our podcast, please go to livinghour.org. If you enjoy our podcast, please consider becoming a patron. You can become a patron for as little as a dollar a month, which will ensure that we can continue our podcast for years to come. To become a patron, please visit patreon.com. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com. Simply do a quick search for the Inspirational Living Podcast at patreon.com to find our Patreon page and learn more including the free gifts we offer to every patron. Subscribe to our free podcast today at the iTunes Store, or at Google Play, or at Stitcher.com. Thank you for listening. We look forward to being with you next time. Welcome to the Inspirational Living Podcast, brought to you in part by Book of Zen, makers of inspirational fashion and gift ideas. Visit them online at bookofzen.com. Today's podcast has been edited and adapted from the essay Optimism by Helen Keller, who despite being both deaf and blind, lived a life of unbridled optimism and accomplishment. Could we choose our environment, and were desire and human undertaking synonymous with endowment, all people would, I suppose, be optimists. Certainly most of us regard happiness as the proper end of all earthly enterprise. The will to be happy animates every individual, no matter their profession, education, or social station. No matter how dull, or how mean, or how wise we are, we feel that happiness is our indisputable right. It is curious to observe what different ideals of happiness people cherish, and in what singular places they look for this wellspring of their life. Many look for it in the hoarding of riches, some in the pride of power, and others in the achievements of art or literature. A few seek it in the exploration of their own minds, or in the search for knowledge. Most people measure their happiness in terms of physical pleasure and material possession. Could they win some visible goal which they have set on the horizon, how happy they would be. Lacking this gift or that circumstance, they would be miserable. If happiness is to be so measured, I, who cannot hear or see, have every reason to sit in a corner with folded hands and weep. 
If I am happy in spite of my deprivations, if my happiness is so deep that it is a faith, so thoughtful that it becomes a philosophy of life, if, in short, I am an optimist, my testimony to the creed of optimism is worth hearing. Indeed, I feel called to rise up in gladness of conviction and testify to the goodness of life. Once I knew the depth where no hope was, and darkness lay on the face of all things. Then love came and set my soul free. Once I knew only darkness and stillness, now I know hope and joy. Once I fretted and beat myself against the wall that shut me in. Now I rejoice in the consciousness that I can think, act, and attain heaven here on earth. My life was without past or future. Death, the pessimist would say, was a consummation devoutly to be wished. But a little word from the fingers of another fell into my hand that clutched at emptiness, and my heart leapt to the rapture of living. Night fled before the day of thought, and love and joy and hope came up in a passion of obedience to knowledge. Can anyone who has escaped such captivity, who has felt the thrill and glory of freedom, be a pessimist? My early experience was thus a leap from bad to good. Even if I tried, I could not check the momentum of my first leap out of the dark. With the first word I used intelligently, I learned to live, to think, to hope. Darkness cannot shut me in again. I have had a glimpse of the shore and can now live by the hope of reaching it. So my optimism is no mild and unreasoning satisfaction. A poet once said that I must be happy because I do not see the bare, cold, present, but live in a beautiful dream. I do live in a beautiful dream, but that dream is the actual, the present, not cold but warm, not bare but furnished with a thousand blessings. The very evil which the poet supposed would be a cruel disillusionment is necessary to the fullest knowledge of joy. Only by contact with evil could I have learned to feel by contrast the beauty of truth and love and goodness. It is a mistake always to contemplate the good and ignore the evil, because by making people neglectful it lets in disaster. There is a dangerous optimism of ignorance and indifference. It is not enough to say that the 21st century is the best age in the history of mankind, and to take refuge from the evils of the world in ethereal dreams of good. How many good men and women in the 19th century, prosperous and contented, looked around and saw naught but good, while millions of their fellow men and women were bartered and sold like cattle? No doubt there were comfortable optimists who thought Wilberforce a meddlesome fanatic when he was working with might and main to free the slaves. I distrust the rash optimism in this country that cries, Hooray, we're number one. This is the greatest nation on earth. When there are grievances that call loudly for a remedy. That is a false optimism. Optimism that does not count the cost is like a house built on sand. We must understand evil and be acquainted with sorrow before we can call ourselves an optimist and expect others to believe that we have reason for the faith that is in us. I know what evil is. Once or twice I have wrestled with it, and for a time felt its chilling touch on my life. So I speak with knowledge when I say that evil is of no consequence, except as a sort of mental gymnastics. For the very reason that I have come in contact with it, I am more truly an optimist. I can say with conviction that the struggle which evil necessitates is one of the greatest blessings. It makes us strong, patient, helpful men and women. It lets us into the soul of things and teaches us that although the world is full of suffering, it also is full of the overcoming of it. My optimism, then, does not rest on the absence of evil, but on a glad belief in the preponderance of good, 
and a willing effort always to cooperate with the good, that it may prevail. I try to increase the power that God has given me to see the best in everything and everyone and make that best a part of my life. The world is sown with good, but unless I turn my glad thoughts into practical living and till my own field, I cannot reap a kernel of good. Thus my optimism is grounded in two worlds, myself and what is about me. I demand that the world be good, and lo, it obeys. I proclaim the world good, and facts arrange themselves to prove my proclamation overwhelmingly true. To what is good I open the doors of my being, and jealously shut them away from what is bad. Such is the force of this beautiful and willful conviction. It carries itself in the face of all opposition. I am never discouraged by absence of good. I never can be argued into hopelessness. Doubt and mistrust are the mere panic of a timid imagination, which the steadfast heart will conquer and the large mind transcend. Every day I find myself looking forward with beating heart and bright anticipation to what the future holds of activity for me. My share in the work of the world may be limited but the fact that it is work makes it precious. The desire and will to work is optimism itself, for work, production, brings life out of chaos, makes the individual a world, an order, and order is optimism. Despite my handicaps, I can work, and because I love to labor with my head and my hands, I am an optimist in spite of it all. I used to think that I would be thwarted in my desire to do something useful, but I have found that though the ways in which I can make myself useful are few, the work open to me is endless. Charles Darwin could work only half an hour at a time, yet in many diligent half hours he laid the foundations of a new science. I long to accomplish a great and noble task but it is my chief duty and joy to accomplish humble tasks as though they were great and noble. It is my service to think how I can best fulfill the demands that each day makes upon me and to rejoice that others can do what I cannot. The world is moved along not only by the mighty shoves of its heroes, but also by the aggregate of the tiny pushes of each honest worker and that thought alone suffices to guide me in this dark and wide world. I love the good that others do, for their activity is an assurance that whether I can help or not, the true and the good will stand sure. I trust, and nothing that happens disturbs my trust. I recognize the beneficence of the power which we all worship as supreme, order, fate, the great spirit, nature, God. I recognize this power in the sun that makes all things grow and keeps life afoot. I make a friend of this indefinable force, and straight away I feel glad, brave, and ready for any lot the universe may decree for me. This is my religion of optimism. Optimism, then, is a fact within my own heart. But as I look out upon life, my heart meets no contradiction. The outward world justifies my inward universe of good. All through the years I spent in college, my reading was a continuous discovery of good. In literature, philosophy, and history, I find the mighty witnesses to my faith. Philosophy is the history of a deaf-blind person writ large. From the talks of Socrates up through Plato, Berkeley, and Kant, philosophy records the efforts of human intelligence to be free of the clogging material world and fly forth into a universe of pure idea. A deaf-blind person ought to find special meaning in Plato's ideal world. These things which you see and hear and touch are not the reality of realities, but imperfect manifestations of the idea, the principle, the spiritual. 
The idea is the truth. The rest is delusion. If this be so, my fellows who enjoy the fullest use of their senses are not aware of any reality which may not equally be in reach of my mind. Philosophy gives to the mind the prerogative of seeing truth, and bears us into a realm where I, who am blind, am not different from you who see. When I learned from Berkeley that your eyes receive an inverted image of things which your brain unconsciously corrects, I began to suspect that the eye is not a very reliable instrument after all, and I felt as one who had been restored to equality with others, glad, not because the senses avail them so little, but because in God's eternal world, mind and spirit avail so much. It seemed to me that philosophy had been written for my special consolation, whereby I get even with some modern teachers who apparently think that I was intended as an experimental case for their special instruction. My small voice of individual experience joins in the declaration of the philosophy that the good is the only world, and that world is a world of spirit. It is also a universe where order is all, where an unbroken logic holds the parts together, where disorder defines itself as non-existence, where evil, as St. Augustine held, is delusion, and therefore is not. Thus from philosophy I have learned that we see only shadows, and know only in part, and that all things change. But the mind, the unconquerable mind, encompasses all truth, embraces the universe as it is, converts the shadows to realities, and makes tumultuous changes seem but moments in an eternal silence, or short lines in the infinite theme of perfection, and that evil is but a pause on the way to good. Though with my hand I grasp only a small part of the universe, with my spirit I see the whole, and in my thought I can encompass the beneficent laws by which it is governed. The confidence and trust which these conceptions inspire teach me to rest safe in my life as in a fate, and protect me from spectral doubts and fears. Blessed are we that have not seen, and yet have believed. The Inspirational Living Podcast is a production of The Living Hour. For free transcripts of our podcast, please go to livinghour.org. If you enjoy our podcast, please consider becoming a patron. You can become a patron for as little as a dollar a month, which will ensure that we can continue our podcast for years to come. To become a patron, please visit patreon.com. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com. Simply do a quick search for the Inspirational Living Podcast at patreon.com to find our Patreon page and learn more, including the free gifts we offer to every patron. Subscribe to our free podcast today at the iTunes Store, or at Google Play, or at stitcher.com. Thank you for listening. We look forward to being with you next time. Welcome to the Inspirational Living Podcast, brought to you in part by Book of Zen, makers of inspirational fashion and gift ideas. Visit them online at bookofzen.com. Today's podcast has been edited and adapted from the book, Your Forces and How to Use Them, by Christian D. Larson, published in 1910. Every word that is spoken exercises a power in your personal life, and that power will work either for or against you, depending upon the nature of the word. You can talk yourself into trouble, 
poverty or disease. And you can talk yourself into harmony, health, and prosperity. In brief, you can talk yourself into almost any condition, desirable or undesirable. Every word is an expression, and every expression produces a tendency in some part of you. This tendency may appear in the mind, in the body, in the world of desire, in character, or anywhere in the personality. Our expressions determine largely where we are to go, what we are to accomplish, and how we are to meet those conditions through which we may pass. When our expressions produce tendencies towards sickness and failure, we will begin to move towards those conditions. And if the tendency is very strong, all the creative energies inside you will move in the same direction, focusing their efforts upon sickness and failure, and thereby producing such conditions in your life. On the other hand, when our expressions produce tendencies towards health, happiness, power, and success, we will begin to move towards those things, and in like manner create them in due measure. Every word has an inner life force, sometimes called the hidden power of words, and it is the nature of this power that determines whether the expression is to be favorable or not. This power may be constructive or destructive. It may move towards the superior or the inferior. It may promote your purpose in life or it may retard that purpose. And it is the strongest when it is deeply felt. Therefore, the words which we inwardly feel are the words that act as turning points in our lives. When you feel that trouble is coming and express that feeling in your speech, you are actually turning your path and beginning to move towards that trouble. We all know that the more trouble we feel in the midst of a problem, the more troublesome that problem will become. And we also know that that person who retains poise and self-control in the midst of trouble will pass through it all without being seriously affected, and when it is over, is much wiser and stronger for the experience. When you feel that better days are coming and express that feeling in your speech, you turn all the power of your being towards the ideal of better days, and those powers will begin to create better circumstances in your life. Whenever you talk about success, advancement, or any desirable condition, try to express the feeling of those things in your words. This inner feeling determines the tendencies of your creative powers. Therefore, when you feel success in your speech, you cause the creative powers to create qualities in yourself that can produce success. While if you express the feeling of doubt, failure, or loss in your words, those creative powers will produce inferiority, disturbance, discord, and a tendency to mistakes. It is in this way that the thing we fear comes upon us. Fear is a feeling that feels the coming of ills or other things we do not want. And as we always express through our words the feelings that we fear, we form tendencies toward those things, and the creative powers within us will produce them. Whether the inner life force of a word will be constructive or destructive depends upon several factors the most important of which are the tone, the motive, and the idea. The tone of every word should be harmonious, wholesome, pleasing, and should convey a deep and serene expression. Words that express whines, discontent, sarcasm, aggressiveness, and the like are destructive. Nothing is ever gained by complaints that are whining, nor by criticisms that are critical. When the things are not right, state so in a tone of voice that is firm and strong, but kind. Words of constructive power are never loud or confusing, but always quiet and serene, filled with the very spirit of conviction. Never give expression to what you do not wish to encourage. The more you talk about a thing, the more you help it along. The walls have ears, as they say 
and the world is full of minds that will act upon your suggestions. Never mention the dark side of anything. It will interfere with your welfare. To tell your troubles may give you temporary relief, but it is a broadcast that often produces another crop of more trouble. If you have troubles, turn your back upon them and proceed to talk about harmony, freedom, attainment, and success, and feel deeply the spirit of these new and better conditions. Thus you will begin to create for yourself a new life, new opportunities, a new environment, and a new world. Never speak unless you have something to say that gives cheer, encouragement, information, or inspiration. The motive of every word should be constructive, and the life expressed in every word should convey the larger, the better, and the superior. Such words have building power, and thus they should express, as far as possible, absolute truth. What is meant by speaking absolute truth is a matter that most people do not understand. So let me provide a few examples taken from our daily speech. People who think that they have to say something and have nothing in particular to say always take refuge in a brief description of the weather. In their descriptions, they usually employ such expressions as It is so hot today. This is terrible weather. What an ugly day and so on. But such expressions do not change the weather, and there is no use of talking if your words are not to be of value in some way. You may say all sorts of disagreeable things about the weather without changing the weather in the least, but will such expressions leave you unchanged? Positively not. Whenever you declare that something is horrible, you cause horrible thoughts to send their actions all through your nervous system. These actions may be weak, but many drops, no matter how small, will finally wear away a rock. When people talk about themselves, they seldom fail to give expression to a score of detrimental statements. Here are a few. I can't stand this. I feel so tired. I cannot bear to think of it. I am thoroughly disgusted. I am getting nervous. My memory is failing. I am getting old. I cannot work the way I used to. There is no chance for me anymore. This has been a hard day. I have nothing but bad luck. If I eat that, I'll get fat. A thousand more statements, all of them destructive, might be mentioned, but Anyone who understands the power of thought will realize at once that such statements can never be otherwise but injurious and should therefore be avoided. These statements are not only injurious, they are also untrue, absolutely untrue in every sense of the term. The fact is, you can stand almost anything if you forget your human weakness and array yourself in spiritual strength. You do not have to get tired. Most work does not make anyone tired so long as they get enough sleep every night. It is wrong thinking that makes people tired. These are scientific facts. The person who permits themselves to become disgusted by anything whatsoever is talking themselves down to the plane of inferiority. When you feel disgusted, you think disgusting thoughts. And such thoughts clog the mind. You cannot afford to think negative thoughts simply because something else is bad, because we daily become like the thoughts we think. We cannot improve disagreeable things by making ourselves disagreeable. Two wrongs never made a right. The proper course is to forgive the wrongdoer, forget the wrong, and then do something substantial to right the whole matter. The person who constantly thinks that they are easily disturbed, disturbs themselves. When we are in harmony with everything, including ourselves, and refuse to be otherwise, nothing will ever disturb us. The person who is nervous can make the matter worse by saying that they are nervous. Because such a statement is a nervous statement, and full of discord. 
When we begin to feel nervous, we can remedy the matter absolutely by resolving to remain calm and by employing only quiet, positive, and constructive speech. Your words will cause you to move in the direction indicated by the nature of your words, and it is just as easy to use words that bring calmness and poise as those that bring disharmony and confusion. If you believe that there are no opportunities for you, this is caused by the fact that you have hidden yourself in a cave of inferiority. Go out into a life of worth, ability, and competence, and you will find more opportunities than you can use. The world is ever in search of competent minds, and modern knowledge has made it possible for us to develop our abilities. Almost no one has any legitimate reason for speaking of hard luck or hard times, unless you prefer to live in a state of want. The more you complain about hard times, the harder times will become for you. While if you resolve to forget that there is such a thing as failure, and proceed to make your own life as you wish it to be, the opportunities for success will surely come. The idea that the pathway of life is all uphill work is also a false one, and if we give that idea expression, we are simply placing obstacles in our way. Nothing is uphill work when we approach it properly, and there is nothing that helps more to place us in true relationship with things than true expression. The person who declares that there is always something wrong is always doing something to make things wrong. When we have wrong on the brain, we will make many mistakes, so there will always be something wrong brewing for us. When wrong things come, set them right, and look upon the experience as an opportunity for you to develop greater mastership. The greatest essential is to make all speech constructive. In daily conversation, the law of constructive speech should be conscientiously applied. What we say to others will determine to a considerable degree what they are to think, and what tendencies their mental actions are to follow. And since we are the product of our thoughts, conversation becomes a most important factor in the development of ourselves and others. We steadily grow into the likeness of that which we think of the most, and what we are to think about depends largely upon the mode, the nature, and the subject matter of our conversation. When conversation originates or intensifies the tendency to think about the wrong, the ordinary, or the inferior, it becomes destructive, and likewise it tends to keep before the mind the faults and defects that may exist in human nature. To be constructive, conversation should tend to turn attention upon the better side, the stronger side, the superior side of all things, and should give the ideal the most prominent place in thought, speech, or expression. When anyone is going wrong, it is a mistake to warn them not to go further. It is also a mistake to leave them alone. The proper course is to call attention to something better, and frame our conversation in such a way that they become wholly absorbed in the better. They will then forget their old mistakes, their old faults, and their old desires, and focus their attention and power to the building of that better vision which now fills their mind. It is common for us to try to make our friends perfect according to our own idea of perfection and we usually proceed by constantly talking to our friends about their faults and what they should not do in order to become as perfect as our ideal. Parents, as a rule, do the same with their children, not knowing that through this method many people are made worse. Indeed, it is only those who are very strong in mind and character that are not adversely affected by this method. To help our friends or our children to become ideal, we should never mention their faults. Our conversation should deal with the strong points of character and the greater possibilities of mind. We should so frame our conversation that we tend to make everybody feel that there is something in them. 
Our conversation should have an optimistic tendency and an ascending tone. It should deal with those things in life that are worthwhile, and it should always give the ideal the greatest prominence. Weakness of human nature should be recognized as little as possible, and should seldom, if ever, be mentioned. When people engage in destructive conversation in our midst, we should try to change the subject by calling their attention to the better side. There always is another and a better side, and when examined closely, it will be found to be far greater and infinitely more important than the ordinary side. Admirable qualities exist everywhere, and it is always in the best interest of ourselves and others to give these our undivided attention. The Inspirational Living Podcast is a production of The Living Hour. For free transcripts of our podcast, please go to livinghour.org. If you enjoy our podcast, please consider becoming a patron. You can become a patron for as little as a dollar a month, which will ensure that we can continue our podcast for years to come. To become a patron, please visit patreon.com. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com. Simply do a quick search for the Inspirational Living Podcast at patreon.com to find our Patreon page and learn more including the free gifts we offer to every patron. Subscribe to our free podcast today at the iTunes Store, or at Google Play, or at Stitcher.com. Thank you for listening. We look forward to being with you next time.